Hello, everyone, and welcome to week five of Teaching the Conspiracies. My name is Wes Fryer, and this has been an interesting experience. I hope you are finding it valuable. I will really value any feedback that you have on any part of our course. This is the first time that I'm offering this as a six-week asynchronous Anytime Learning Micro-Credential course, and I know that we're coming to this content from different perspectives, and so I'll just value any feedback that you have. What I would like to do briefly in this video is go ahead and provide an overview for you, as I have been doing, of what we've got lined up in the way of required media, a Flipgrid reflection, a weekly create, and optional media for this week. So in terms of the required media, the slideshow that I'm going to actually go through most of with you right now briefly, um, I have a full video of me teaching this lesson um, to middle school students. But this video that we're going to see this week really is the heart of my media literacy lesson about SIFT because this is the example of finding trusted coverage. Recognizing that J.P. Sears, the author and comedian of the video we watched last week, 13 Reasons the Moon Landing Was Faked, is just not a fantastic source for this topic. And so by finding a filmmaker and by reading laterally to learn more about these people, um, J.P. Sears has a Wikipedia page. S.G. Collins incidentally passed away in the last few months, um, sadly, and um, the resources that I have to laterally read, he's, he doesn't have or hasn't had a Wikipedia page, um, but he um, has a, what is it called? Wiki people. It's another, another page. Anyway, this is the heart of the lesson. Um, and so I do have a link here to the list of conspiracy theories on Wikipedia. Teaching middle school students, I am not steering them here. You know, there, there's all kinds of rabbit holes that we can jump into. And <sighs> While many of these are are you know could be interesting and fun, that whole question of when does when does this move from fun to dangerous is is important. So here's the slideshow, and I'll go ahead and go this go through most of this with you. I won't show the videos, but this is the the third main part of this lesson. And in some cases, when I have done this lesson, I have actually required my students to go ahead and make a sketch note about each video that we have done. Now, I like to make these on my iPad. Sometimes, as you can see here on the right, I will use a whiteboard that is in my classroom um, to do that. In fact, I have in the bonus media or the optional media for this week a narrated sketch note. So this picture, but with me moving it around or moving around on the picture and narrating it and talking about it. That's another fantastic media literacy strategy, a, a, a multimedia product that students can create that I think is real valuable. But I've also given my students last semester the chance to create several info pics about the key ideas from the video. And sometimes that's nice because not everybody is enjoying sketch noting, wanting to get into it. I do have some examples in the uh, weekly create this week of some really superb sketch notes that a couple of my students just last semester had created. I've already shown you this slide, but this is key. How do you decide what to believe? This is really the focus of this entire unit and learning about SIFT to, to get strategies to help us make those decisions. I have a uh, link here, which I won't play for you, to National Treasure, and we've talked about this a little bit already. There is a line somewhere between fun and dangerous, and so it's good to talk about that. Birds aren't real. I also introduce to my students, sometimes at this stage, I know that I moved the contemporary conspiracy theories up in my plan for this course. Um, and so this is certainly an example of a, of a contemporary conspiracy theory. It's satire. But if you're not familiar with it and you didn't watch that 60 Minutes clip that we had, I think in week two for, uh, or week three for contemporary conspiracy theories. I encourage you to do that as well as check out the Wikipedia article. I previewed this earlier in our course, but this really is a fantastic, I think, um, kind of overview of the gamut of conspiracy theories. And so not all of my kids now know about Shane Dawson and the Chuck E. Cheese um, conspiracy theory that got him all kinds of likes on YouTube, but I really see that as kind of a low stakes, not a not a really you know 
certainly not politically contentious one to talk about. I don't dive deep into the political contemporary conspiracy theories. I really haven't even talked this year about Travis Case and Taylor Swift and the Super Bowl. Um, but the contentious ones, I mean, you know, have we been visited by intelligent beings from other places? You know, there's a whole series on the History Channel called Ancient Aliens. Um Climate change, global warming, those are those are contentious things. And I'll talk about national treasure and how, you know, we have conspiracies around the Knights Templar and talking about, you know, what happened to their treasure and uh, the Masons and things like that. Um, but it is so important, I think, to acknowledge the reality of some conspiracy theories. And I really think Operation Paperclip, while that is quite dark and and touches on you know some terrible things that that Nazis did that were war crimes it points to the fact that we had a conspiracy in the United States government that was classified and secret and we really did bring the scientists to the United States and they played a pivotal role in the development of our space program and and our intercontinental ballistic missiles and all of that so this is a really important slide to talk through with students um, if you haven't read Annie Jacobson, boy, I tell you, that book, and I did reference that already in our week on contemporary conspiracy theories, it is a fantastic deep dive. I love her as an author, and I have uh, read and listened to several of her books. Um, familiarize yourself with Operation Paperclip. I think it's an important thing to, to recognize for students that we're not presenting as teachers the idea that there are no conspiracies. In fact, one of the key ideas that I highlight for my students, and we watched this in the J.P. Sears video from last week, usually conspiracy theorists are going to weave in a mix of factual content along with really wild claims that are unsubstantiated or not supported. And that can make it very difficult to be able to fact check especially when things are coming at us so quickly as they did in the J.P. Sears video and they do this week in the in the S.G. Collins. Um, we talk about why these are appealing and I admit to students, I don't know, but I do know these have been around for a really long time and maybe this idea of having someone to blame, a malevolent villain, a simple story because life is complicated and maybe people like to have something a little simpler and maybe they find that to be reassuring amidst times of complexity, chaos, and change, which we certainly find ourselves in today. And I know with artificial intelligence and how quickly that is changing, we really are, as some people have said, in the elbow of the exponential growth curve. And, and things are just changing so, so fast. So in that environment, perhaps conspiracy, conspiracy theories offer some reassurance. We've already done this in terms of introducing SIFT, but this is the, uh, the essence of this entire lesson. The graphic that's on the left, I actually have printed in color on a banner um, in my classroom. And it is one of the most important visual aids that I use regularly in my classroom. And frequently when we are looking at some kind of a news article or even I call them wonder links, um, we will we'll do this. We'll stop and investigate the source and consider whether that source sounds like someone who can be trustworthy. Um, and, and if not, we'll try to find a different source. And sometimes we will even trace to the original. But this is the core strategy, the core framework um, that I want to introduce and familiarize students with. So the lesson today is comparing J.P. Sears to S.G. Collins. What is the truth of the Apollo moon landing? Did we land on the moon in 1969? Um, S.G. Collins says we didn't have the technology in 1969 to fake what people saw on television. And because you know my middle school students today in 2024 were not alive then, and we take so much technology for granted. Collins brings this up. We sort of have this faith now in movie magic, but technology was very primitive in 1969. So um, I do show my students a little of the um, it's a long time, and obviously you don't watch this whole thing. But you know, this was the live broadcast that people were were watching on their televisions, and. Um, you know, the the graininess of this, the, the low-tech nature of this, um, it's not something that students have had experience with. Um, I include this video, and this is in the bonus uh, 
I think, uh, media for this week too, of uh, astronaut Eugene Cernan running and jumping on the moon. This idea that how would that have been faked, right? This is a very important idea. And, and so if you were going to fake the low gravity environment of the moon, as Collins is going to talk about, you would have to, you know, either over crank or, you know, modify the film that, that you're using and that you're watching. I also show this, okay, because while I, I don't like the term digital native and I don't use that with my own students, this idea that, oh, you know, kids know everything about technology, they don't. And many of them have not experienced film projectors. And so I explained that, you know, back in the not so distant past, we didn't have videos from YouTube or Netflix or Hulu or any of this. And in order to watch a movie, you went to a theater and you had to watch film that actually went through the projector. And that film had to be developed and processed. And so on the left, we have a film camera. And when S.G. Collins talks about film magazines and a mag that has so many feet of film, this is what he's talking about. Um, and so this is the video. Now, I actually did remove four seconds of it because there's a reference that is has a little sexual innuendo, and I just didn't think it was appropriate for my students. And so this particular link, you can find this public link um, without the four seconds removed, but this is one um, that I modified, and I have this as an unlisted link, and so you can't just browse YouTube for it, and I have that embedded here in the slideshow. Now, in this actual lesson in the past, sometimes I've had students um, not only create their sketch note, but narrate it. And we've used a tool called Seesaw to do that. We're not doing that in this class. Um, but anyway, that's the, the real meat of this week's lesson is watching that SG Collins video in full. And so in addition, I think it is valuable um, to talk a little bit about film photography, videography, how film is processed. Um, this is a video talking about the IMAX film projector and, you know, just how large it is and in talking about that kind of technology, because again, that's not everything that students are familiar with. And then this is the task that I give my students. I ask them to go ahead and create a sketch note of Moon Hoax Knot um, and then go ahead and uh, write a script um, about that and then narrate that sketch note and post that to their uh, portfolio that they have on Google site. So I vary that and I've changed that up, you know, over the years a little bit, but, um, you know, like I said, this last year I was giving my, my kids some choices about that. So that is the essence of the, this week's lesson. I've got some direct links to some sketch notes that some of my students created last semester that really were superb. And I think these are great strategies. It is a myth that simply by sharing a video with a student of any age, that content is just going to go into long-term memory. We, I believe we have to do something with it. I think it's really valuable to create media, to literally have the ideas of that video go into our eyes and, or go into our brains through our eyes and our ears, and then have to come out our hand, you know, as we draw and we sketch and we write notes. I think that's a really valuable process in terms of learning. So um, those are all the, the required um, media products. Um, this week in terms of Flipgrid, what I'm going to invite you to do is reflect about the, the video sharing process and reflection process that I'm modeling here. Do you think this is something that could be viable for your situation with the students, adults that you work with um, in terms of developing uh, web and media literacy when it comes to the SIFT framework and conspiracies specifically. Um, also, I'm interested in what some of your reactions were as a learner watching Colin's video, considering the ideas that he presented, juxtaposing that against the video by J.P. Sears. Um, what do you think students that you teach might focus on the most? Uh, of course, if you'd like, instead of Flipgrid, you're welcome to, as always, just respond with text below that. So um, the weekly create is an option, again, to create an info pick or a sketch note. But if you'd also like to, the bonus challenge is to create a narrated version. And I've given you a link here to a narrated version of a sketch note that I did, I think, last year. And 
Again, if you want to take it to that level and your students can, I think that can really deepen the learning a lot. In terms of optional media, again, there is a lot here. Some of these have been included in the slideshow that I just showed you, but then there's some new ones. Um, this is a another. Uh, well, this is a crash course video. I use. Um, John Green's crash course video about Wikipedia uh, with my students before this unit. Um, this one is specifically about lateral reading as a strategy, and it's fantastic. Um, I've also got a couple of videos of myself teaching this lesson, one's for 47 minutes and one's 20 minutes, and so that's why those are on optional. So you certainly do not have to. I'm not expecting you to check those out in full, but I hope you enjoy this. I really, really have enjoyed teaching this for the last four years, I guess, with my middle school students. I think it's very, very important that we find ways to talk about conspiracy theories and to develop by practicing the SIFT web literacy framework, the different steps that are involved in the framework. And so by modeling this, talking about how we can be manipulated by others with video, with information, with media, um, and so we need to stop when we have that unfamiliar source. We need to investigate that source. Lateral reading is a key strategy for that. Wikipedia can help, and the references and resources at the bottom of a Wikipedia page can certainly help. And we need to find trusted coverage, and that may involve going to a different source. Um, and next week, I'll mention a little bit about tracing to the original. I talk a little bit about that, uh, but not as much in this unit. We're, we're really doing the SIF, um, the stop, investigate the source, and find trusted coverage in the SIFT web literacy framework the most. So again, thank you so much for your participation. I value your feedback and hope you enjoy all the activities um, and optional activities here in week five of our course, Teaching the Conspiracies. Have a great week.